Chapter Seven of Hints for Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hints for Lovers by Theodore Arnold Holtain. Chapter Seven on Beauty. Le beauté pour moi, c'est la divinité visible. C'est le bonheur papable. C'est le ciel descendu sur terre. Tophila Gautier Beauty, they say, is but skin deep. That is quite deep enough to enslave mankind. As a matter of fact, it is much deeper. For, to say nothing of health and good spirits, beneath true beauty lies an admirable or a lovable character. And yet, or perhaps, and therefore, if by some mischance beauty should arouse our resentment, with what different eyes we regard it. The feeling for beauty is probably more highly developed in man than in woman. Note bene. Perhaps this is the source of the beauty of women. Nevertheless, it is a question that perhaps will never be settled. How much value should be placed on mere beauty? For man soon tires of mere beauty. In fact, man, the inconsistent creature, soon tires of mere anything. Beauty should never be analyzed. At the sight of a graceful neck, who speaks of musculus sternocleidio mastoideus? At the touch of moist red lips, who thinks upon the corpuscles of Pacini? More women are wooed for their complexion than for their characters. Could women only know it, nothing can add to their charms. How provokingly delightful is the uniform demureness of a hospital nurse beside the elaborate bedizements of a woman of fashion. The most beautiful thing known among men is a good woman, and this is not an anomaly. She who captures a man by a single charm, be it even beauty, holds him by a weak chain. Think not it was merely beauty that made Helen or Cleopatra historic. Beauty is much, and grace is much, but there is a charm more subtle and potent than these. Beauty without modesty is a rose without perfume. The petals may delight, but they lack an ineffable savor. Like a flower, too, though the tangible petals are numbered and compatible, the subtle perfume eludes the sense and is inexhaustible, for modesty is the exhalation of the soul. At once it enhances, as it refines, the potency of beauty. Nay more, the sacrosanct aureole of modesty beautifies all it surrounds, though with divine or haze imperfection there is none. So, given a red lent balm, and the lowliest herb becomes treasured and precious, and each human soul has its own individual essence. What folly were the violet to envy the rose, since beauty is much, and grace is much, and main and demeanor and wit. But a prepotent and psychic essence there is transcending the power of these. And, as the suave and subtle essence is not distinct from, but springs from, the tangible and numerable petals, so the spirit perceives that its fleshy vesture is not a thing apart, to be donned and doffed at will, to be contemned or left out of regards, but indeed an integral and inseparable portion of itself. For in the very woof and warp of flesh, spirit is imminent and enmeshed. Indeed, though in a mystic sense, vesture and wearer are mutually one. And yet, love ever essays the task of seeking out the psychic wearer beneath the corporeal vesture, often with plaintive strife. When seeker and sought make a mutual search, the starkest strife is condoned. But alack! The mystic unity of the human soul is never wholly divulged, not even to love, not even to love. End of chapter 7 Recorded by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, August 2009